Okay. Um, welcome to our Ask a Physicist for September. Um, as always, before we get started, I have just a few announcements, and that is that our next Ask a Physicist will be on October 25th, and the question that will be addressed is, is there a shadow biosphere? Um, also announcing that this presentation, the recording of it, will be posted on our Beyond Center YouTube channel within the next couple of days. So um, look out on social media for the announcement of that. And then also make sure you're following us on um, social media or checking your emails for the link registrations for next month's Ask a Physicist. And then lastly, just a reminder, if you have a, a question um, during the presentation to use the Q&A feature and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Malik. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome everyone to uh, tonight's Ask a Physicist webinar. Um, the Ask a Physicist series is brought to you by the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. Uh, this is a kind of one of a kind um, center at Arizona State University. Uh, and it has um, where we sort of study the big questions in science, if you like. Uh, everything ranging from uh, what is gravity, what is, a, what is time, and to what is cancer. Uh, and uh, we have uh, today, um, so, the, so the Beyond Center is uh, directed by Professor Paul Davies, who I don't think is here, and there's also, uh, this is, um, the deputy director is uh, Sarah Walker, who is with us today. Um, and usually these Ask a Physicist webinars are, uh, are have a long Q&A session. Today's format will be a little bit different. We have, we're very honored to have Professor Frank Wilczek speaking and he's gonna be giving more of a public lecture but there will be time at the end for questions from the audience. So let me uh, then introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Frank Wilczek, who was also my thesis advisor long ago. Um, so uh, let's see, Frank Wilczek grew up in was uh, in New York City, where he was a product of uh, public schools, much like one of his idols, Richard Feynman. Uh, and he then went to the University of Chicago um, to, for his bachelor's degree and, and then came to Princeton University, where um, he, at, a, at a, I think at the age of maybe 21, he discovered uh, what, what is now known as asymptotic freedom. Asymptotic freedom is part of the theory of quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of the strong force. This is a force that one of the four forces in nature that, um, that holds the nucleus together, overcoming the repulsion of protons. Um, and so what Frank found was that uh, if you bring the quarks really close together, um, the, the interaction actually switches off. So it's very much unlike gravity, which gets stronger at closer distances. Uh, Frank's uh, uh, discovery of asymptotic freedom went on, uh, resulted years later in him getting the Nobel Prize for physics. Um, so he's a real physics Nobel laureate here, um, but uh, that was not his only discovery. He also, uh, among his many, many other contributions to physics, he's come up with uh, the idea of axions, which is one of our leading candidates for uh, dark matter, uh, for, with a, for anions, which, is, um, which are sort of two-dimensional particles that uh, could be used and that are being used in uh, quantum computing. Um, and uh, he's worked on black holes and on time crystals and all sorts of things. And most recently with me on the idea of that we might be able to detect quantum gravity at gravitational wave detectors. Um, what else do I wanna say? He lived in Albert Einstein's house uh, once upon a time, but uh, now he's all over the world. And, um, at uh, Stockholm University in China and, uh, and at MIT, and uh, most importantly, at Arizona State University. We're very happy to have him uh, two, two months of the year um, at ASU. So he's a local, um, and uh, without further ado, uh, let me pass it on to him. Oh, no, there is further ado. He's gonna tell us today about uh, self-replicating uh, machines um, the technology of the future. And this brings to mind a similar talk um, many years ago by Richard Feynman, who asked, uh, who gave a talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, in which he asked whether, well, it's a, it's a talk about the physics limits of, on technology. So thank you very much and take it away, Frank. Thank you, Malik. So as advertised, I'll be talking about 
the subject of self-replicating machines, which is not a subject that I've contributed much to yet, but I find it absolutely fascinating. And uh, for me, giving this presentation is, is a, is, has been a, uh, a learning experience and an inspiration. And I hope I can convey some of the reasons that I feel so interested and so inspired by this topic. Because I, I think it's going to be an important part of engineering in the future. And in fact, I think in the long term, it's the future of engineering. <laughs> so let me start by giving a little bit of historical context, a brief history of biologically inspired engineering. Biological artifacts have inspired inventors uh, for as long as there had been inventors. And uh, in particular, Leonardo da Vinci, who uh, was a very uh, inspired inventor, uh, was uh, an, an artist. So he, uh, his, his thoughts were memorably recorded in in artistic uh, creations that have, that have uh, come down to us through the ages, uh, was inspired to design flying airplanes, helicopters, tanks, and submarines by birds, fish, turtle, but birds, uh, sorry, maple leaves, correct that, maple leaves, or maple seeds, I should say, maple seeds. maple seeds, turtles, and fish, respectively. And these are beautifully recorded in his notebooks. Here's the uh, flying machine inspired, um, sort of resembles a biplane inspired by birds, meant to be human propelled. Uh, here is the helicopter design inspired by the well, here that was the lead in page to this one with the mature helicopter design. And here's the tank. And you can see upside down, it looks helpless like a turtle <laughs> dangling its legs around. And the submarine. And so, all of these. Uh, that, uh, of course, that's only one representative of, of many. Of, uh, engineers and, and inventors who've been, invent, who've been inspired by biology. Uh, I'll just skip to the very recent times, the present, uh, there's been explosive development in the use of artificial neural nets, which as their name implies, were inspired by biology. Uh, simple models of the computations performed by neurons have become a powerful tool in information processing and especially have become the cutting edge of pattern recognition, so-called deep learning. So here is a comparison of an actual neuron to a neural net and to, uh, to uh, the neurons that occur in a neural net. And in each case, you have inputs that are summed to give uh, a signal that comes out that's then distributed to other neurons. So it's a very, direct mapping of the biology into the artificial construct. <clears throat> and then the modern neural net is just putting many, many of these together. And you, uh, this turns out to be a powerful way of uh, representing information and processing it that, uh, as I said, has led to extraordinarily revolutionary developments in recent years in pattern recognition. But none of these, impressive as they are, none of these really gets into deep biology. These are macroscopic or semi-macroscopic manifestations of biology. The central theme or 
leap motif of biology has not been exploited very much yet. What is that? Well, I would claim, and not only me, but such a you know, real biologist like uh, Professor Paul Nurse, Nobel Prize winner in his recent book, uh, the, the, uh, What is Life, uh, would say that uh, self-replication with variation is the center, is the deep theme that runs through uh, life as we know it today. First of all, it's central to evolution. I think I, for this audience, I don't think I need to say much about that, but here's uh, Darwin's finches, which uh, in, uh, uh, he found on the Galapagos Islands, but recently, relatively recently on geological timescales, he knew settled by birds and, uh, and already branched off into several different kinds that were adapted to the conditions on the different islands. The same theme, reproduction, self-replication with variation is also the key to development of the embryos into organisms. They start with a single egg, a uh, fertilized egg, and then it, uh, it, it goes through many cycles. And uh, at first, the the products are all the same, but then they become differentiated into many, many types of cells to make the final organism. So, and, and so that, that, that's the development of the embryo. If we go further along in the process, for instance, if we want to discuss the uh, development of the neural system, the, the, the nervous system, again, it's self-reproduction within different regions of cells. Many, many cells are reproducing themselves with characteristics that vary by region in an orderly way and then assembled into the nervous system and together with other systems uh, making the whole organism. And also the same trick is what allows maintenance and repair of uh, organisms. So uh, there's a self constant process of renewal where uh, when you have damaged organism, you have uh, stem cells that can, can take different forms that can uh, mature into different forms. They, re they retain some of the characteristics of the embryonic cells that can branch into different forms and therefore, and they can be directed, programmed by local conditions to form different kinds of cells that can repair injuries or just uh, compensate for the wear and tear of, uh, of life. So your stem cells, can uh, retain the characteristic even in the adults, stem cells can uh, take different forms uh, in response to local chemical signals. And we're beginning to, uh, biologists are beginning to understand exactly how this works. All these cells have the same genetic code, but there are processes called epigenetics, which typically involve uh, attaching methyl groups to, uh, to the DNA, which activate and deactivate different genes. And it's by changing the program of the genes that we get different cell types. So this is particularly interesting, I think, in view of later developments in the nervous system, where uh, and in the brain where you have the neural stem cell giving different types at different times and different places in response to different uh, chemical conditions and uh, enabling a architecture of the brain to be uh, laid down. Now, all this inspired uh, 
the person I would say is the closest we have to a modern da Vinci in terms of inventiveness and visionary character. Uh, that's John von Neumann. Uh, as far as I know, he wasn't a great artist. He didn't draw uh, striking images, but he did. He worked in, instead in equations and logical formulas, and those are equally beautiful to those who know how to interpret them. Uh, von Neumann is famous as the developer of the von Neumann architecture for computers, which is uh, schematically involves uh, a stored program within the uh, computer and uh, a, a random access memory. It's the underlying architecture that, under, that is used in almost all modern computers. Here is von Neumann together with uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer at the Institute for Advanced Study where he was a professor with one of the pioneering vacuum tube computers on which he worked uh, at the time. Now, von Neumann, amazingly, in view of his uh, accomplishments, which not only include uh, the architecture of the von Neumann architecture of computers, but also uh, the theory of games, which is central to modern economics, as well as uh, achievements in, as well as laying down uh, the foundations of quantum information theory, which only today is being appreciated. At the, despite, uh, did all that in a rather, rather short life. He died before the age of 60, I think in his mid fifties. And at the end of his life, he was working on another uh, adventurous project. That is the theory of self-reproducing automata, he called it. Uh, he didn't get to finish his book on the subject that he was working on, he, he, uh, but he had extensive notes which were collected by uh, his colleagues and disciple, uh, Arthur, Arthur W. Burks, into this remarkable book, Theory of Self-Reproducing Auto self Automata, in which he gives profound ideas about what's necessary to make a self-reproducing automaton that anticipated later developments in biology, as I'll show you. Uh, and he gave very detailed designs of specific cellular automata, special kinds of computer programs that would embody self-reproducing machines, self-reproducing automata. Uh, this is Sidney Brenner, a famous biologist, and he's going to tell you why von Neumann's idea about the deep nature of life was right. And Schrodinger's has written down in his famous book, What is Life is Wrong. So, whoops. Now we have a conflict between keynote and Zoom, so I'm going to have to revert, go outside of the play mode in order to show you this video. I think he made a fundamental error. He's speaking and of Schrodinger now. fundamental error can be seen in his idea of what the chromosome contained. He says, in describing what he calls the code script, he says the chromosome structures are at the same time instrumental in bringing about the development they foreshadow. They are law, code, and executive power. Or to use another simile, they are the architect's plan and the builder's craft in one. And in our modern parlance, we would say, they not only contain the program, but the means to execute the program. And that is wrong, because they don't contain the means they only contain a description of the means to execute it. Now, the person that got it right, and got it right uh, before DNA, is von Neumann in developing the logic of self-reproducing automata, which was based, of course, on Turing's uh, previous idea of automaton. And uh, he gives this description of this automaton, which has one part that is the machine. This machine is built under the 
instructions of a code script, that is a program. And of course, there's another part of the machine that actually has to copy the program and insert a copy in the new machine. So he very clearly distinguishes between the things that read the program and the program itself. In other words, the program has to build the machinery to execute the program. And in fact, he says it's, uh, when he tries to talk about the uh, biological significance of this abstract theory, he says uh, this automaton E has some further attractive uh, sides, which I shall not go into this time at any length. Okay, so. Uh, now, actually, to be perfectly uh, um, clear about this, that they actually uh, at an early, there are so-called ribosomes that do embody the Schrodinger picture. Namely, they combine both genetic coding and enzymatic, enzymatic action. So there are uh, certain RNA molecules that also can act as enzymes. Those are the so-called ribosomes. So they have both information and, uh, and, and, and active uh, components. Uh, but they are very, very minor kind of oddball uh, molecules in modern life. Uh, they may have been the earliest forms of life and might, might, may very well have been this kind of thing. Uh, they, in, they inspire the RNA world hypothesis about the origin of life. But today, there are the advantages that von Neumann realized of separating the instructions for making the machine from the actual machine, uh, uh, have uh, have been uh, beautifully realized in the in modern biology because the instruction is in the DNA buried in the nucleus and the cell machinery is quite separate and uh, I won't go through the details of this but basically uh, the script has to be copied first and then the machinery can copy the script it can also make little changes. And so you can have self-reproduction with variation. And uh, I won't show it, but I do want to emphasize that von Neumann uh, didn't just wave his hands, but he wrote very definite computer programs based even with the primitive computers at the time. So they couldn't be run, but he, he made definite computer programs that uh, realized uh, these principles. And in subsequent years, people have, um, with modern computers, actually implemented his designs. They are things called cellular automata. Cellular automata are two-dimensional grids. So this is a simplified world in which you have uh, simple rules that tell you uh, different states of the, the different of the, of the uh, sites within the automaton uh, that, tell, that, that uh, tell it what to do. They're, so they're, they're e each little cell, each which is uh, basically represented by one pixel in a modern computer uh, would have a variety of states it can be in. And uh, there's a bath of stuff that it can act on to uh, grab pieces to start reconstructing itself. And there's a tape that gives it instructions for uh, what to do. And again, there are very, very concrete, detailed uh, designs for these things and, uh, and they work. Uh, and nowadays people have even uh, added mutations and shown that they can be inherited. And if you're interested in pursuing this, there's a uh, 
there's a beautiful website where, where it's, it's made uh, relatively easy to set these things up and play with them. Now, that's in a sense a computer game, a very sophisticated computer game where you make these little creatures that live in two dimensional grids and reproduce themselves given a world in which there are uh, little chemicals, little parts of which they can make use. Uh, so it's a model, but people have actually uh, attempts, started to, uh, have made an attempt, made attempts, several attempts to try to uh, make three dimensional real world versions of these things uh, at a macroscopic level. In fact, uh, there's a book that has a very detailed account of the different attempts uh, where uh, people have uh, made Lego constructions that uh, pick up other Legos and uh, make copies of themselves plus other stuff that you can program in. Uh, I think, again, these are just thought designs. They don't actually work <laughs> because of friction. They're very much like in the early days of computers when uh, uh, Babbage designed his analytical engine. Uh, the designs were good, but the mechanical technology was too awkward and slow and frictional and to, to make it happen. But uh, you can follow the logic and certainly should work uh, and, and, uh, and other kinds of attempts uh, have been to make three-dimensional printers that grab pieces off the floor that are capable of assembling into a three-dimensional printer. And uh, you can see it's rather clunky. Again, it's supposed to work according to the, de to the design, but never has actually uh, been able to uh, fully complete a reproductive cycle. So this is very much a technology waiting to be born. Again, I think it's quite analogous to uh, Babbage as a forerunner and uh, mechanical com uh, computers as a forerunner to modern computers. So ultimately, the way forward has to be to make things that are small, that don't have friction, and that are uh, cheap and flexible. And that brings us to the world of nanotechnology and tiny machines. Uh, and there are now tiny gears and tiny machines that you can use as components in the designs that were designed uh, either schematically in the, uh, in the uh, cellular automata and, and von Neumann designs, or more concretely in the uh, Lego and, three, and, and, and uh, printer, uh, 3D printer designs, uh, you can begin to implement those in pieces that are really small, that don't have so much friction. And uh, this is a technology waiting to be born. This, you can see the relative size of these machines. Uh, 50 microns is here. Uh, and for comparison purposes, there are some red blood cells and some pollen. Uh, DARPA had a competition to make a mechanical bee that flies and is the size of a bee and can also take pictures and do some spying. And uh, people did it. <laughs> now, these were not self-reproducing, but they do show you the possibility of making, uh, self, uh, making very tiny machines. And I would suggest to DARPA that in the next round, they uh, add to the requirements that the bees can uh, have sex and self reproduce. <laughs> Uh, machines are even being made now at the molecular level 
there was a recent Nobel Prize in Chemistry for understanding uh, molecular machines that uh, are vital to how cells work. I'll show you a picture of those in a moment. And uh, for the synthesis of simpler versions of these machines. Now, this is a completely useless machine, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting kind of existence proof. What this does is uh, rotate on an axis very, very fast. And then there's another ring molecule that's attached to the axis. There are stoppers on the two sides. And as this rotate very fast, the ring goes slowly back and forth and bounces back and forth. <laughs> and that works. Uh, and so it's, it's a step. It's, uh, we can also tinker with biology to make use of uh, existing self-replicating machines and tinker with them to make them do produce things that we want to produce. This is a thriving field due to the possibility of reprogramming DNA molecules now, especially with so-called CRISPR technology. It's becoming quite uh, uh, convenient, much cheaper and much faster. Uh, progress has been very rapid in the less than a decade since this uh, process was introduced uh, and it, uh, that enables you to cut DNA strands at uh, specified locations where specified uh, molecular configurations are found and then insert other uh, configurations. So to reprogram the DNA. This is one of those molecular machines that I mentioned uh, now, uh, uh, understood very concretely, and this is, I'm not sure if it's kinesin or denison, it's one of, one of the molecules that uh, transports things along these kinds of uh, microfibrils, which form a skeleton of a cell, and do the work of transporting protons and uh, proteins into uh, the places that they should go. And here's a picture of these guys. These are tiny molecular machines. And they are doing this inside your body right now. Do you understand what? Uh, this is a little long, hey, so I won't show the We have to zoom out. But you get, that's the highlight. Every day in an adult human body, 50 to 70 billion of your cells die. Either they're stressed or damaged or just old. But th this is normal. In fact, it's called programmed cell death. But to make up for all these lost cells right now. Billions of your cells. Let's skip to the chase. Yeah. Chromatids containing the identical copy. Well, actually, I've shown you the best oh, part. So <laughs> we could create realistic depictions. You have. Uh, and these are tiny molecular these machines. Tiny molecular machines. They are doing this inside your body right now. Along the skeleton of the cell. Do you understand cell. why we have to zoom out? Every day, and we're learning in an how to make, body. make those kinds of molecules and uh, program them to carry things from place to place. So the tiny machines are coming along, and we also have uh, the. Uh, the kind of liquid matrix, or so, actually a so-called liquid crystal matrix that can hold things in place and give uh, geometric uh, stability to kind of, to structures. And yet, be, so it has a sort of crystalline structure. And yet, because it's also uh, 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 possible to shove the molecules around, uh, that's the liquid crystal, liquid part of the liquid crystal, uh, you can transport and erect structures within it. And these are, these liquid crystal structures are now being reproduced and in different forms uh, engineered. And they are the things that in, in biology separate different cells, uh, uh, cells uh, 
interior from the exterior and also within cells make so-called organelles that have different kinds of, uh, of tasks, sort of organs within the cell. So there are a lot of bits and pieces. What's missing is to put it all together, to put together the kind of intellectual structure that uh, von Neumann sketched with the uh, technology of tiny machines and the architectural ideas or the, the uh, synthetic ideas of making uh, the machines do something useful. So kind of the mechanical engineering and uh, chemical engineering that uh, so, so that, uh, that you can make a system out of these things. What would it all be good for? What could you imagine uh, that this kind of engineering would be good for? Well, I think the extraordinary power of self-replication with, uh, with variation is seen in the fact that human beings with uh, a trillion cells and all kinds of structure and the ability to think and, and do quite crazy intellectual adventures all come from one cell originally that uh, unleashes the power of exponential growth. So one cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. And after uh, about 30 generations, you have a trillion and that gives you enough to make a human being. 30 is quite a finite number and 30 different kinds of tweaks along the way can differentiate you along different paths to make the different kinds of cell types and organs that make the human being. So making complex organisms, not necessarily human beings, presumably not human beings, but organisms that can uh, uh, do more modest but useful tasks uh, is possible should be possible. Uh, but let's, let's go ahead and, and extrapolate this further. The visionary science fiction author, Olaf Stapleton, who wrote in the 1930s, but to me is uh, still probably the most visionary and, and uh, inspiring science fiction author ever, uh, wrote a book called Last and First Men, which was a history of the future of mankind, where mankind evolves through uh, nine different, qualitatively different stages. And of a special interest is the fourth man. These are the giant brains. These are shown to scale. And the thing is, the third man became very good at genetic engineering. He didn't have the ideas of modern engineering, but somehow intuited that uh, uh, the ability to manipulate biology would be something that uh, the third man, third man would develop. We're not, we, we are the first man, of course. Uh, then uh, these giant brains can be, uh, once you have the power of exponential growth, the distance from a human brain to a giant brain is just a few more cycles of growth. Maybe four or five more cycles makes a brain 16 times as big or 32 times as big, or uh, seven cycles makes it 100, more than 100 times as big, and there you go. Uh, now, why is that at all plausible? Why is that sort of development of the brains in particular at all, at all plausible? Well, I think it's extremely plausible actually because uh, the brain, the human brain, but also uh, animal brains in general consist of one basic design uh, repeated over and over again. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but well, a lot, but not, but not, uh, but not, uh, not outside the spirit of the truth. So 
basically you have many, many, many repetitions of the same basic module. Uh, module. Uh, this is called a uh, mini column in, in the uh, neuro, neurobiological literature. And in humans, it has six layers of different cell types that you can recognize in different places. It's the thin outer part of our, uh, uh, of our brains uh, where most of the work is, uh, the intellectual work is being done. It's, uh, I think less, uh, it's about a millimeter thick. If you undid all the folding of the brain, it would make it be about uh, a cubic yard. And that's, but, and, and it would all consist of these, of many, many copies of these cortical uh, mini columns. The, uh, for instance, one, one cortical mini column in the uh, visual area of the cortex might be devoted to sensing uh, lines in a certain orientation. And the next, the neighboring mini column would have sensitivity to a different orientation and so forth. So they all, each column does a specific, does an, in, uh, an independent, uh, uh, a, an information processing task. And the same architecture evidently can be used to do many different kinds of information processing tasks. And by repeating this process through more or fewer cycles of self-replication, you can get brains of different sizes. Humans have, are distinguished from uh, our immediate uh, ancestors like, uh, or, or uh, closely related species like uh, chimpanzees and bonobos by the fact that we have more cycles of self-replication. That is a burden. It makes human childbirth very difficult. Uh, the head has a hard time getting out and there's a very prolonged period of helplessness because the, the infant is produced uh, uh, immature. But the price that that evidently has been a price worth paying in terms of just getting a larger uh, number of mini columns. Uh, the, but the fact that you get the same damn thing over and over again means that it's not at all crazy to think that self replication with variation is 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 the, at the bottom of it and that it could be something that could be engineered. And if you put, if you produce brains in a vat and maybe underwater, so you don't have mechanical problems, uh, there's no reason that uh, once you understand how to do it, you could make the giant brains of the fourth man. Another grand project that could, uh, benefit from exponential growth and really is practically inconceivable without some form of exponential growth is the project of terraforming planets. This is the idea that you can take a hostile planet and then process it using uh, self-replicating machines to uh, chemically treat, chemically uh, alter its atmosphere, uh, maybe uh, make uh, plant organisms and the organisms themselves could be self-replicating machines that, uh, uh, that do that kind of processing for you, but also produce food uh, for humans if you want to, if, if it's desired to terraform things for human habitation. Or they could produce factories to produce uh, useful goods. All kinds of grand projects you can imagine if you unleash the power of exponential growth. And the variation allows you to uh, not only produce a lot of things, but produce different things or 
things that are complex with different kinds of parts. This might be uh, particularly relevant in view of the fact that, uh, that mankind is busy changing the earth into a hostile environment by injecting enormous amounts of carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we, we may need soon to terraform Earth itself. And, uh, if, it, if you want to make a relatively small terraformed world like an asteroid, you can imagine making a shell. And of course, science fiction people have gone to town. Mm -hmm. I want to mention that uh, a professor at Arizona State University, Professor Lackner, uh, was, one, was a visionary in uh, imagining the possibilities of uh, self-reproduction, doing something useful. Uh, in fact, uh, making solar cells way ahead, already back in 1995, he was thinking of uh, and designed uh, things called auxons that uh, could uh, produce exponentially large numbers because of self-reproduction, self-replication, uh, produce uh, exponentially large numbers of solar panels. And now that solar panels are much better understood and cheaper, and so are tiny machines, it might be time to rethink this vision, which ran out of steam, but uh, the underlying idea was maybe just ahead of its time. Okay, now I've, uh, I've uh, been kind of purposely naive about the, uh, the throwing around the idea that we'll have uh, giant brains and, and machines that replicate themselves. Things, of course, could go horribly wrong. And uh, many of you may know from the movie Fantasia, the memorable the, uh, sequence called The Sorcerer's Apprentice to the music of Rimsky-Korsakov, where Mickey Mouse is uh, the apprentice of a sorcerer who learns a magic trick of uh, making a broom that can serve him. He, as the apprentice, he has the lowly task of cleaning up the, the premises. Uh, so he, he uses his new, newly acquired powers to, to make a broom, but then he gets ambitious and says, let's, let's, I got this wonderful helper, let's have several of them. And he makes the broom self-reproducing. But then uh, things get out of hand. <laughs> the, the, the master of sorcerer has to rescue them. This is a warning that self self, a powerful technology that grows exponentially could easily get out of hand. Uh, I'll give one more example. I'm, um, uh, it's a pity that Professor uh, Davies is not here. He probably would recognize this example. This is a bane of Australia. This is the, the, cane, the infamous cane toad. The, the cane toad was introduced in order to uh, uh, deal with a pest that was uh, infesting the, the sugar cane crop of, of Australia. It wasn't very good at that, but what it was very good at was self-reproducing. And now it's kind of overrun Australia. These guys uh, are kind of unpleasant characters. They have poisonous glands and, uh, and they're kind of ugly as we see. They're big guys that have become a, a blight on Australia and, and are still spreading uncontrolled. So that's a real life sorcerer's, real life uh, broom, broom, broom uh, realization. But uh, 
I do think those kinds of problems are manageable. And so I'd like to end with a much more friendly picture of uh, self-reproducing machines that uh, take on uh, a part of the human character. That, um, since it's us who are gonna make them, uh, we can attempt to make them like that. So uh, with that, I'm, uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, I think we'll have uh, Sarah. Would you like to um, moderate the questions? Yes, happy to do it. Uh, thanks so much for excellent um, talk. So we do have a few questions that came in ahead of time. And for those of you um, in the audience now, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A. We have about 10 minutes for questions because we started about two minutes late. Um, so I'm going to ask one of the questions that came ahead first, and then I'll start taking ones from the live audience. Um, so this question comes from Yambo Zhang, uh, which is in symbolic systems, it seems easy to do reference. You just simply need to write the name of the system or function, but how can we do this thing through numeric systems? So I, I think the question is about how we go from symbolic logic and reference into thinking about numerical models of self-referential systems. Any insights on that one? It's a tough question. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, it's not difficult to translate from uh, logical to numerical symbols. I mean, Logic is based on zeros and ones, and as long as we use binary notation, so are numbers. And uh, yeah, I don't, I, I just don't understand the question. So, okay, so, well, we, we have a lot of questions, so we can move on to other ones. Right. Um, so here's a, a, a more philosophical question, which is if machines can replicate themselves, could they qualify as a form of life? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, as I said, here we're getting at the deep aspect of life. And so when, so if you're reproducing the deep aspect of life, uh, the, the distinction between life and non-life becomes quite blurry. I would say. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's partly a matter of definition, of course, what, what you want to call life. You, mm -hmm. you, you could put among the, uh, among the defining quantity uh, qualities of life that it's, it's based on carbon chemistry, for instance, and then the self-replicating machine wouldn't necessarily have that quality. But if you define life in terms of what I think is its deep structure, that is self-replication with variation, then any reasonably complex system that has that character should be called a living system. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so this question is loosely related to that, just about the scale of what you might talk about as life. So this, um, this comes from Keith Patario. I hope I'm saying that right. Do you think there is a scale limit to do self-replication? Is it only possible to do at the nanoscale or will it be possible to do at the human scale? Well, humans do it, so it's definitely possible to do it at the human scale. Uh, however, uh, I think the question is a little deeper, which is whether the primary actors in this technology, the, the things that we produce exponentially, uh, will ultimately be something at a uh, macromolecular size or, or uh, much bigger. And I think the, uh, the basis will almost certainly always be macromolecular because the macromolecules have so many favorable properties. As we saw, they can be used to make machines. Uh, those machines are basically frictionless. They run very conveniently on uh, ATP or other molecules that can be produced in, in great numbers. So they have many, many good properties. Uh, or maybe the most profound property uh, is that they make the problem of making, of getting reproducible parts solved. Uh, quantum mechanics and the basic character of the physical world 
at the molecular level gives you molecules that are precisely identical. They have identical properties. Whereas if you're working with macroscopic things, uh, it's, it's a very challenging engineering problem to make reproducible parts. Right. And, uh, so, so, and of course, if you're going to uh, build complex machines, having parts with known properties and, and accurately characterized is a tremendous advantage. Great. So I, th I think it would, so I think, yeah, I think it'll be, it'll be inevitable that that, that property is, is central to uh, carrying out this program. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, great. So the next question comes from Barbara Temple, and this is kind of thinking more cosmologically about these problems. Assuming we're not alone in the universe, why don't we see alien machines strewn about the galaxy? So if this is inevitable technology, why don't well, we see it out there? <laughs> well, the galaxy is very, very big. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there are lots of stars in the galaxy, of course, but they're also uh, mostly very, very far away. Uh, and especially if you want to send anything large uh, from one galaxy to another, uh, you can't, you have, it can't be spent, it can't be sent very fast. Uh, then, uh, so uh, it just may be that uh, they're too far away. Also, maybe they don't want to bother. Why, why should, who cares? I mean, but, uh, with, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I said at the beginning, there, there are many, many stars. So, so to look for signs of life or signs of intelligent life on all of them by sending machines out there is very, very difficult. Uh, what you can send is uh, um, information. And so perhaps, or, or, or very tiny things, you know, so a few molecules, some, maybe some DNA molecules you could, you could send. And then uh, if you put them in the right environment, they'll sprout. So like, like this. Uh, uh, boil down seeds, they boil down seeds. So, uh, so I, I think it's much more plausible that an advanced civilization would send down boiled send around boiled down seeds than they'd send around any kind of any kind of uh, big machine or of course their own bodies which are going to be big big machines uh, now so we can rephrase the question why don't we see seeds growing <laughs> from uh, that have been sent by distant civilizations and uh, maybe there aren't so many uh, distant civilizations that are capable of doing it it's as for the reasons that the galaxy is so big and that there are so many potential targets, it's a challenging, challenging problem. Uh, certainly we couldn't do it. Uh, and the indication of evolution on earth, I think, if you take it at face value, is that while life emerged rather quickly, once the conditions became at all hospitable, you know, once the earth uh, was not a, a molten ball of lava, uh, but but a more or less solid thing with uh, with uh, uh, liquid water, uh, which uh, which happened about four billion years ago. Life emerged almost immediately, uh, but it was not. But it was a very simple kind of life. So it was you know one one celled uh, prokaryotes, uh, and that was four billion years ago, and then it took roughly three and a half billion years ago. <laughs> three and a half billion years from then until multi-cell creatures evolved. So, uh, so the, the step from life to, from no life to life may be very simple, but the step from uh, life in its original form to uh, even multi-cell life, let alone intelligent life, may be very rare. Uh, on Earth, you know, human intelligence only emerged quite recently, and human civilization only really emerged in the last 
10,000 years to be generous and technological civilization only in the last 200 years. And it was highly contingent. That 10,000 years is probably correlated with the fact that we're now living through uh, a rather warm period between uh, ice ages. <laughs> That's quite rare. Uh, yeah. The end of the, uh, we were blessed by the demise of the dinosaurs, which seemed to be a stable condition that might have lasted for a long time. And without that, uh, intelligent life, certainly in the form we know it, would not have arisen on Earth. So, although I think that life may very well be common throughout the galaxy, I think complex life is likely to be fairly rare, and intelligent life may be extremely rare. So, that's. that's and then intelligent life that's capable of mounting ambitious and wants and cares about mounting ambitious engineering attempts to contact life in other places, maybe you know, even more rare on top of that. So, so, so. Great. Um, so I think we're out of time for questions because um, we're at the end of the hour. So uh, thank you again so much for the wonderful talk and for being our on our guest this time. Um, okay. and it was awesome. I also want to thank our audience um, for listening in. And next month, we are back for another Ask a Physicist. Um, and Paul Davies will be back for that one. You don't want to miss it. It's on the shadow biosphere, which is a concept uh, he co-proposed um, a while ago and is exciting and thinking about the possibilities for alien life on Earth. So we will see you all next week. And thank you again. That was really Thanks, great. Frank. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye now.